a good crew we have up here up front. Can we give them a round of applause? They helped us in very short time move over 205, that's exact number, 205 shoe boxes. And that was our goal this year, 200. So we, we met our goal. That's wonderful. So at this time, we're going to ask that all the kids, kids, if you can get in a position where you can put your hand on a box. Put, put a hand on a box. Make sure you're tucking, touching the box. Come up here on the podium if you need to. 
Good. Okay, we're going to bow and we're going to have a special prayer this morning. Bow your heads. Heavenly Father, Lord, we just thank you for this opportunity. We thank you for uh, the opportunity to serve and to share your love with those through this Christmas shoebox ministry. We thank you for your generosity for those who gave their time and resources and those who prayed for this ministry. And we ask, Lord, that you bless these boxes and that the, every item inside may meet the need of the children who receive them. And, and that more importantly, that they carry a message of your incredible love and grace. We pray for the children and the families who will open these boxes. And we pray, Lord, that they have their hearts touched and that they're able to see the hope and the joy and the peace that comes from knowing you. And Lord, we ask that you guide the hands to those who distribute these boxes. Pray, Lord, for the people who drive the vehicles and the pilots who fly the planes and the missionaries who hand them out, but mostly for the children that receive them. We pray for you to protect the journey and to allow each of these boxes to come to a child that it is meant to come to. And Lord, ultimately, we ask for the seed of faith that plants the gospel message inside the hearts of children all over this world, that the ultimate gift that can be given at Christmas time is the gift of you and your love for this world. For it's in your name, Jesus, most magnificent name we pray. Amen. Thank you, kids.
From the highest of heights to the depths of the sea Creations revealing your majesty From the colors of fall to the fragrance of spring Every creature unique in the song that it sings All exclaiming sun and gives source to its light, yet conceals it to bring us the coolest of night, and none can fathom, indescribable, uncontainable, you place the stars in the sky and you know them by name, you are amazing God. And Isaiah 40, 28 says, have you not known? Have you not heard? I hope we all have heard. The Lord is everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He does not faint or grow weary. His understanding is unsearchable. Sing this with me. Oh, Lord, my God, when I am Son, the lion and the lamb, the lion. 
Scripture passage this morning is from John 3, 16 and 17. Actually, I think it's 14 through 17 on the screen there, so we'll go with that. Verses 14 through 17. And as Moses lifted up the servant, serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in Him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, 
that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. The great lengths that God went to so that you and I could have an eternal home in heaven. He sent his son Jesus from the glories of heaven to come here as a man and to die on the cross. And I'm greatly inspired by the great lengths that people will go to to get that message around the world. And these shoeboxes are one example of that. There's a lady by the name of Rita. I cannot pronounce her last name. I'm afraid I'll butcher it. But she felt burdened to reach the isolated, impoverished villages of Ghana because she knew that they'd never heard about Jesus and they worshipped idols. And she wanted to go, but nobody would go with her. The people would tell her all the time, well, the roads are too bad, it's too far to travel, it's too dangerous, the journey would be too hard. But finally she found through the Operation Christmas Child group that there were leaders who would be willing to go with her on the treacherous journey through the steep, muddy, rocky terrain, two hours hiking, and at times tempted to turn back, but it was worth it because when they got to the village where they were going, the people were very happy to see them. The chief greeted them and welcomed them, and he said this, For you to come here means that you love us. With a shoebox was also a gospel presentation, as I said, in the discipleship, as you saw in the video, uh, 12 class discipleship for the children. And with all of that, gifts that were given, we take for granted what we receive under our Christmas tree. One 14-year-old girl received a box, and in it were some notebooks and some pencils. And I saw pictures of her in the magazine, and she was overjoyed. And she said, I am so happy and excited to have all of this. I would never know how to get these things. A simple notebook from the dollar store, and some pencils, things that our kids take for granted all the time. But God used that as the gospel was planned in her life. Now, Rita, the lady I'm talking about, is an optometrist over there, but her highest priority is telling people about Jesus. She said, He's everything to me. I found my Jesus, and He is enough. She said, I'm passionate about doing this because I trusted Christ as a child and was transformed. But I want you to go back and think just for a moment about what the chief said. The chief said, for you to come here means that you love us. And that's John 3.16 in a nutshell. That God loved us so much that he sent his son to die for us so that we would have a savior. Martin Luther said that John 3 is the gospel in the Gospels. So I want to look at John chapter 3 today. Of course, we read verses 14 through 17. We're not going to go back and read the whole chapter. I love doing that. That's just the way I'm wired. But I know that for the sake of time, we won't do that. We'll just think about those verses. But let me give you some background leading up to verses 16 and 17. You probably know the story that Nicodemus a very important man, a Pharisee, a member of the Sanhedrin, the highest court in the land, the Jewish Supreme Court. He comes at night to see Jesus. Nobody knows for sure why Nicodemus came at night. There's a lot of speculation, but if you look at it symbolically, he comes in the dark to see the light of the world. Uh, he doesn't just come and see Jesus and say, it's nice to meet you. He comes with some questions and Jesus has some questions and some words for him. And Jesus knows what Nicodemus needs. And not only does he know what Nicodemus needs, Jesus knows what humanity needs. Because the Bible tells us in John chapter 2, verses 24 and 25, that Jesus knows the heart or knew the heart of all men. Jesus knows what you need this morning and he knows what I need this morning. Now, as I talk about John chapter 3. If you've been in church most of your life, you know John chapter 3. You know John three sixteen, 
you may be tempted. The enemy is the one who's doing this to tune this out. You know this. You know this up one side, down the other, backward and forward. And that is wonderful. But let me say to you that if you really love Jesus, this never gets old. You can never hear this enough. You can never master this. Jesus loved you and knew exactly what you needed. And as Nicodemus came to him that night, he realized that Nicodemus, or he knew that Nicodemus needed more than just a teacher. And might I say to you that we need more than great teaching. When Nicodemus comes to Jesus, he comes to him in verse 2 as a teacher. Being highly educated and associating with a highly educated group, Nicodemus was being polite when he called Jesus rabbi because the Pharisees would have been considering Jesus not a rabbi but as somebody who's ignorant because he had not had the proper theological training. He was a, counsel, excuse me, a carpenter and the council did not expect him to know theology. But Nicodemus is interested in theological matters. That's his line of work. And he knows that what Jesus has been doing. He stated that he knew that Jesus had to be from God because nobody could do what Jesus was doing without the fact that God was with him. So he was coming to the source to find out more about what he was seeing and what he was hearing. The signs indeed were pointing to who Jesus was. They were indicators of the real message. And at this point, it seems that there were many who had a belief in Jesus because of the signs. It was as if they were saying, you're no doubt a miracle worker because you couldn't do these things unless God enabled you to do it. But that was it. There was no trust. There was no faith. There was no belief in Jesus for pardon and forgiveness. There was no belief in Him as the Messiah. There was no dependence on Him for eternal life. So Jesus gets to the heart of the matter very quickly with Nicodemus. He says, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Unless one is born from above or born again, he's not going to be able to see the kingdom. Now one of the popular topics for the Jews at that time was ushering in the kingdom. Jesus, of course, knew this, and he knew that Nicodemus would be interested in the kingdom. But what about this born-again business? Jesus is speaking a different language than Nicodemus, and I'm afraid today that Jesus is speaking a different language than many of the people, even in our churches. Because Nicodemus only knows the language of the earth. It's possible today that there are people who are only interested in the things of the earth. They're only interested in the language of the earth, but Jesus is speaking the language of heaven. The Apostle Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14, that the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, and he cannot understand them, for they are spiritually discerned. I want you to hear that again because I want to park here just for a second because there's something eating at me. The natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God for they are foolishness to him. I want to say to you this morning that if you are not interested in the things of God if you are not interested in His Word, if you're not interested in listening to His Word, if you're not interested in reading His Word, you need to examine your heart because you may not be saved. And here's why this concerns me. Because I hear stories from time to time of people who let me know that there are folks in our church who don't go to Sunday school or Bible study. They don't see the importance. But even worse than that, they will come to a worship service and go somewhere and hide in the bathroom stall the whole time preaching's going on. Or they leave the room about the time the Bible study starts. Or they don't want to go to the revival meeting. Because it could be that they don't know Jesus in their heart and life. Because if you do, you're going to be interested in what's in this book. 
And we shouldn't have to go scouring in the closets and in the toilet and in the balcony and in the attic and in the basement to find where you are. You should want to be here. And how sad it would be to me to think that somebody could walk out the front door of the church into the pit of hell because they were just here because it's religion. I've got to go. Somebody made me. Mama made me. It's expected if I'm not there. Now, you may not like this. You say, ooh, I don't like you raising your voice. <laughs> It just troubles me. I'm supposed to be a shepherd of the flock. The shepherd of the flock cares where the sheep are. And they're supposed to be assembled with God's people when we get together, not off hiding somewhere. Why do you even come? You say, well, don't tell me that. I'm sitting in here. And yes, you are. But some people can sit in here and zone out. Let me tell you something. I recognize fully that I, every day of my life I am unworthy to stand in this spot. I'm not worthy to be here. And I'm probably not qualified to be here. But for whatever reason, I ask God this quite often, He put, why did you put me here? And so because of that, I am greatly concerned... Are we concerned? Do we care? Do we even believe there's a heaven and a hell? Do we believe what God says about salvation? I'm way off my notes now. I don't even know where I am. But I tell you, this is an indicator of our heart. It's an indicator of our heart to just want to be taught a little devotional message. See, Nicodemus was coming to Jesus because he knew Jesus to be a teacher or so. He was teaching people. People were listening even though he wasn't qualified to be a teacher according to the, the academic people. And let me say to you that it's a blessing to be smart and it's a blessing to be rich and it's a blessing to be powerful and interested in spiritual matters. But in order to see the kingdom of God, you must be born again. It's good to see Jesus as a great teacher and a positive role model, a miracle worker and a prophet. But unless you're born again, you'll not see the kingdom. And I just believe that if you're born again, you're going to be in love with his stuff and his purpose and his being. You're going to be in love with him. You know, if you love somebody, what interests them interests you. Now, I mean, you may not be completely... I mean, how many wives could care less about football or NASCAR? I mean, there's a lot of wives that do. They might like it more than their husband, but there's a lot of wives that don't. But they, they hang out with their husband while he's involved in all of that because they love him. And how many men could care less about going to a Hobby Lobby? <laughs> or Michael's? come on, honey, we're going to Michael's. And the guy's like, oh, great. You know, well, I'm married into this and I love her, so I guess I got to go. But if you love Jesus, you're going to be interested in the things that Jesus is interested in. There is a type of belief that believes that Jesus did perform miracles and that he was sent from God, but that belief stops short of putting reliance in Christ as Son of God and Savior. What does it mean to be born again? Here's what Peter, the late Peter Gomes, Dr. Peter Gomes said. He said, what born again means is literally to begin all over again, to be given a second birth, a second chance. The one who is born again doesn't all of a sudden get turned into a super Christian. To be born again is to enter afresh into the process of spiritual growth. It's to wipe the slate clean. It's to cancel your old mortgage and start again. In other words, you don't have to always be what you have become. Such an offer is too good to be true for many, confusing for most, but for those who seek to be other than what they are now, who want to be more than the mere accumulation and sum total of their experiences, the invitation, you must be born again, is an offer you cannot afford to refuse. And if you truly get born again, you will never get over it. 
you will say it's got to be grace. The older I get, the more I realize it has got to be grace because as hard as I try, I'm not going to be perfect. I'm always going to mess up. I don't know if you've discovered that in your life, but I notice it every single day. We've got to constantly be on task. The, the second thing I want you to notice is that Nicodemus needed more than religion. We need more than responsible religion. Nicodemus takes what Jesus says literally as if a man has to be reborn physically. And, and that's because religious people are always wanting to know what do I have to do and how do I get to that point of doing it. They're all about the outward. We know from Scripture that the Pharisees love to pray in public. They love to be seen. They love to wear their robes. They love to discuss the minute matters of the law. They were seen as pious and righteous. Surely if anybody was going to etern inherit eternal life, they would. Nicodemus is looking what, for what a man can do. And isn't that what religion is? Religion is a system of doing what is right to appease the gods or in our Christian life, God. Jesus tells Nicodemus, you can't do it that way. The rebirth, the regeneration comes from above. But we live in a world with all this Bible teaching and with the evangelistic emphasis that some of our churches have people in them that don't believe this. There was a, a survey of 7,000 Protestant youth and more than half of them believed that the main emphasis of the gospel was on God's rules for right living. The gospel is about grace. It's not about rule keeping. 60% of them agreed that sincerely trying to live a good life is the way to be accepted by God. 45% of adults surveyed believe that even though they've been saved or born again or have made some sort of personal commitment to Jesus, that they would go to heaven by living a good life obeying the Ten Commandments, or because all people go to heaven. Some people said they didn't know what would happen to them at death. Jesus is not talking about religion. He's talking about regeneration, something you cannot get on your own. I want you to think about your physical birth for a moment. We know from elementary biology, we did not create ourselves. Our parents both contributed to our being. I'm not going to go into science class at this point. <laughs> you all get the picture. Our physical being is a gift. We had no choice in the matter as to when, where, or even if we would be born. Spiritual birth is from above. We don't initiate salvation. The Spirit does. We don't tell the Spirit where to move or when to move or on whom to move or whom to save or when to do it. You might have one 11-year-old child who doesn't get it and another 11-year-old child who's been getting it for three years and is ready to go through the waters of baptism. The other 11-year-old child may not get it until they're 33. We don't know why it works that way. We don't know what's going on. It's a mystery to us. But the point of the matter is that God is the one who is in charge of the process. He is drawing people to Himself. And the Spirit works in powerful, powerful ways. He works in our lives in powerful ways, and we need to accept that. Keith Wagner tells a story of a shipwreck survivor who was washed up on a small island. And the man constantly looked for help on the horizon, but none came. And so he prayed, and he continued to do what he needed to do, and he built a hut. He scavenged for food. He tried to survive. And one day he came back from hunting for food, and his little his little hut that he'd made to keep him safe in the elements was burning down. Everything he'd worked so hard to build was gone. He said, how could God do this to me? So in anger and grief, he went to sleep only to be awakened by the sound of a ship that was approaching the island. And when he was rescued, he said, how did you know I was here? And they said, we saw your smoke signal. <laughs> and he continued, God acts on our behalf in ways that are beyond our comprehension and imagination, we like to believe that we're in control of our lives. But obviously we're not. Few people are changed directly because of me. Born again, being born again is not about me changing other people, but it's about them opening up to God's Spirit. Which brings us back to the matter of people hiding and people not wanting to hear the Word. See, when you don't want to hear the Word and read the Word and, and be interested in the Word, if you are lost, you're closing yourself to God's Spirit. 
And if you're saved, you're closing yourself to God's Spirit because it's there that He speaks to us every day. The third thing, and this is a very quick point, we need more than legal hope. Nicodemus needed more than the law. Now, he knew exactly what the Old Testament taught about the new birth. It teaches about it in several places. But he also not knew of the laws and the rules and the regulations that had developed through the attempt to keep the law. There were enough rules to fill 800 pages in English and then another set of commentaries about the rules. Some believed, as they still do, that heaven was attained by godliness and righteous living. And as I said before, no matter how hard you try, you cannot keep the law perfectly. You need grace. And I'll guarantee you, I need grace. I'll be the first person to admit that. I, I mean, if it's not for grace, I'm sunk. Paul says the law is a schoolmaster. It show, shows us how short we've come. You can know the law and even live it out better than your neighbor and still not have eternal life. And, and Jesus is getting ready to tell Nicodemus how this new birth comes what Nicodemus needs is not a strict adherence to the law. Nicodemus needs life, and Christ is the one who gives that life eternally and abundantly if we would just grasp that. And so here we come to finally to John 3, 16 and 17. All of these needs are met in Christ. What we need is the good news of a Savior. You remember we preached a sermon here one Sunday on, on um, Moses putting that bronze snake on the pole and raising it up in the wilderness and everybody who'd been bitten by the snake and looked at the snake would live. But they had to humble themselves and they had to choose to look at the bronze serpent. If they were stubborn and said, no, I'm, I'm just going to refuse to do that, they would die. But if in humility they would look at the serpent and just do what Moses told them to do, that God had told Moses to tell them to do, they would be spared death and they would be saved. Jesus is going to be lifted up on a cross. And all who look upon Him in humility and faith and dependence will be saved. Jesus says, whoever believes in me will have eternal life. John Payton said that the word for believe there, he, he said, was translated for the believer, stretch out and rest. Just quit striving to try to make it into heaven and just rest in God. And because he's done so much for you and he loves you so much, you're going to want to follow him if you'll just think about it. John 3.16 encapsulates what we really need to know. It's called one of the primary summaries concerning salvation in the New Testament. Verse 16 through 18 go together. Verse 16 is a statement of fact of the agency of salvation. That It's God who provided salvation. And verse 17 shows His purpose in doing so because He wants to save the world. And verse 18 shows the reality concerning judgment that if you believe in Him, you're not condemned. But if you don't believe in Him, you're condemned already because He who has not believed in the name of the only... because He has not believed in the only... name of the only begotten Son of God. God, our Creator, the Sovereign of the universe so loved, that is, out of love for the world, you and I gave the genuine, self-giving nature of God His only begotten Son. That's a very costly gift. It, it cost Him His Son, that whoever believes in Him, we understand what that means, your trust, your dependence, your reliance upon Him, would not perish but have eternal life. So, so the deal is, is that God desires for you and I not to be judged, not to be condemned, but to be saved. And that ought to thrill our hearts. Christmas ought to thrill our hearts because of that. Easter ought to thrill our hearts because of that. And every day in between ought to thrill our hearts because of that, that God loved me so much, He's not going to allow me to just continue to live in my sin. He wants to change me. Now, here's the final thing. Maxie Dunham told a story that gives a vivid illustration of grace. He said there was a 15-year-old girl who was at a dance in Oklahoma. She was short, she was a bit overweight, and she was not very attractive. She had been crippled from birth. And when the dance began, she simply put her crutches on a chair nearby... And she sat down in another chair and she was content to watch all the other girls get asked to dance 
and to get to dance. And all evening she pleasantly smiled and watched. Nobody can imagine the pain that must have been going on inside of her that nobody would come and ask her to dance. I mean, you can understand that even the nicest boy in the room might be intimidated for a lot of reasons. My friends are going to make fun of me because she's not the prettiest girl in school or she, she's got crutches. How do you dance with crutches? I don't know if I can hold her up. All those things. But in the middle of the dance that evening, a slow number was played and a 16-year-old boy went over and held out his hand and said to her, would you like to dance with me? And she looked up with unbelieving surprise. I'm sure she looked to her right and her left to see if he was talking to somebody else. And with a smile quivering on her face, she said yes. And together they began dancing. The young man held her tightly and she held on to him tightly lest she stumble and fall. And it was a beautiful sight to behold, they say. This is a true story. And later that evening, an adult went over to that young man to express his appreciation. And he asked one question. He said, while you were dancing, I couldn't help but notice that she whispered something in your ear. Would it be wrong for me to ask you what was it that she said to her? And the boy replied, you're not going to believe this. But she said that it was the first time anybody had ever asked her to dance in her whole life. If you can imagine how she felt, then you're beginning to understand grace. God offers that to you and to me. We're sitting over in the corner, full of sin, dirty, tainted, crippled by our sin. And God comes over and reaches out His hand says, let's dance. And then, because we're incapable of dancing with God, He holds us up and gives us strength and swings us and dips us and does all kinds of wonderful things with us because His power is working through us. Because we still are tainted by sin. Because we'll never be perfect. God offers that to you and I. What will be your response? Will you respond to Him and say yes to Him? Or will you continue to try to do it on your own? And I would ask you this question. If you are saved, but you're one of those people who's been uninterested, you're uninterested in the Word, you're uninterested in coming here, you don't want to be here, you try to find ways not to be here. Maybe you're watching at home today and this is you I'm talking to. Um, would you say, God, show me what this is all about. I guarantee if you ask him that, he will.